Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. I, I'm not good on the mic because I speak really loudly. Um, so it tends to be extremely loud when I do that. Uh, but if anybody can't hear me, just raise your hand. Uh, I'll adjust the board. So thank you for having me here. I'm here on behalf of three other collaborators. My name is Cody Havers. Um, I am a professor actually of sport management at the University of Memphis. And um, I'm presenting along with, or I worked on this project with Daniel Wan from Murray State University, Frederick Green from Western Kentucky University, and then Timothy Ryan, another professor at the University of Memphis. So I kind of have a, a different path than I think probably a lot of people here. Um, I started in, and I obviously teach and research in the sport industry. Um, and my research really deals with rivalry and group behavior. Basically, why do we treat people differently based mostly on whatever group we belong to? Now, when I first started researching, we were looking at um, the marketing implications of rivalry. So, if you are a fan of Team A, and how do you feel about Team A, how do you feel about Team B? doesn't really matter which team you support or you identify against. Um, that's what we were looking at. We were looking at the marketing implications of that. Then we started looking more at how can we responsibly promote things. Because if anybody in here um, has watched or read about many sports instances, you know there are some good things that can happen and there are some very bad things that can happen with fandom. Um, I, you open up a newspaper, or now I guess you just click on a news story, and you see countless, from time to time, you'll see countless stories of people doing bad things because they get in arguments about teams or things like that. And we see that in other places as well outside of sport, right? You see it in the political spectrum. Um, you see it in even. I've spoken to some people that we see it like in the comic book spectrum and um, the uh, like the science fiction spectrum and everything. So, about three years ago now, our research kind of shifted a little bit to where we felt like, okay, we have this kind of minute look at what rivalry and fan behavior is in the sports sector. Spectrum, sorry. Now, let's take, let's draw back a little bit and see if we can start comparing how people behave toward their outgroup in the sports setting and other settings. And so when we've done that, we have started looking at a lot of different settings. And I'll have a slide up here just to, in a little bit to show that. But, and that's been really, really interesting because some of the things we expected that within sport, people would be more negative toward an outgroup than they would in a non-sport setting. Um, we've expected that in many instances. There have been some surprises here and there as well. So just, I'm not gonna read this to you, just a little bit of background so you know where we're coming from. Basically, I think most people when you hear competitor or rival, you probably think the same thing. It's a group that you strongly, um, you identify with your group, so you view this other group as a threat to your end group, okay? And typically, that's through direct competition, um, but it can also be indirect competition, and with indirect competition, that might be, if we're talking about politics, direct competition is obviously whatever candidate or party you support, how successful are they against the other candidate or the other, the other party that you don't support? Indirect competition would be, say, a political candidate or party that you don't support experiences some type of negative news or some type of scandal. Um, how happy are you that that happened? How kind of how much joy do you get out of that? So, as I said, a lot of good things can come from rivalry and from sport. We need competitors. It helps people to 
put out their best effort. It helps engage people. It helps engage consumers. Um, as long as it doesn't go too far. If it goes too far, then it opens up a whole lot of negative consequences for both brands. That we, we've done some research on that as well. So here are, I said I would tell you the, the items or the settings we've done so far. And here they are. Obviously, we've looked at sport. We've looked at politics. Looked at online gaming. So this is people who either use a PC or a flat or a platform console to compete. Um, we looked at streaming services. We also looked at game consoles specific to Xbox and PlayStation, mobile phones such as Apple, Samsung, Star Wars, and Star Trek fandom. Marvel is DC fandom. Um, the first and the first glimpse we had of this, or the first study was Disney and Universal. So what we did today is we wanted to take the Disney and Universal study and expand it beyond that to theme park fans. So we were comparing sport vandal with theme park vandal, not just specific to Disney and Universal. Um, and then, so basically our first question is, how does that compare with sport and theme parks? Our second question is, because if you look at the common in group, um, it states that if two people are part of separate in groups, but they have similar interests in something, then they kind of join this higher in group or common in group so people can talk back and forth um, toward one another. An example would be, let's say, a Republican and a Democrat um, are diametrically opposed in their political ideology, but they both support the Miami Dolphins. Um, there's one key factor that they can talk about is the Miami Dolphins. <coughs> Even if they can't talk about other things, it's one thing that they have. In common, and we see that a lot within the theme park fandom setting. So, our initial study, after we cleaned data, had about 100, had 104 participants. Um, I want to expand that to get a better glimpse or a better look at how this works. Um, you can see the gender breakdown along with the ethnicity breakdown. Uh, here is the fandom, how it broke down. People first were asked. If they were a fan of a theme park, a fan of a sport team, or a fan of both theme parks and a sport team. And it broke down pretty evenly. 36.5% were fans of only a theme park, 33.7% only a sport team, and you can see 29.8% said both. Uh, what's interesting is in most settings, that both figure is typically higher than the, the individual figures by themselves or the individual settings by themselves. Now, when we look specifically at theme park fandom, since I'm here speaking about it at this symposium, uh, we look at Disney is was most commonly identified as both the favorite brand and the rival brand. So if we're talking about identification, or I'm sorry, if we're talking about uh, people being able to identify a brand, and that being some measure of brand brand strength then you would have to say the Disney brand is pretty strong um, worldwide. People in the United States may not know that there is a park in Shanghai or Paris, but they know there is a park somewhere, right? Now, the way we measured and compared these groups, first we have an identification scale that we use, and that basically just asked on a scale of one to eight, how identified are you with your um, favorite brand or favorite team within the sports setting if we're talking about that. Uh, there's seven questions in that. For the theme park setting, we had to modify and include, set, uh, include sorry, five of those questions. Then, specifically to measure the perceptions of the out group, we use the rivalry perception scale. This is something that we originally developed um, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and then since we started comparing outside of the sports spectrum, um, we modified some of those items. And it includes four subsets. Basically, how prestigious do you think the out group is? Uh, perceptions of the out group member 
behavior, because we all think that members of our in group behave properly and members of the out group behave poorly, right? Um, linguistic behavior bias back in the 80s um, proves that, that we like to speak favorably of our in group members, not so favorably of out group members. It also looks at um, direct competition. So if we're talking about theme parks, and since we're here in Orlando, I'll use Disney and Universal. Um, if we're talking about theme parks, if you are a Disney fan, how much satisfaction do you get when you compare favorably to Universal in a direct setting or direct situation? And then the last thing that the RPS looks at is that indirect competition. So again, if in a theme park setting, if Universal experiences some type of negative press, how much satisfaction does a Disney fan get out of that? And then vice versa. We also look at glory out of reflective feather, um, which is something, uh, kind of an extension of what I just talked about. Then attitude toward the brand, both the favorite brand and the rival brand. And then the group behavior composite is actually something that compares the four subscales of the RPS along with four subscales. I'll explain here in just a little bit more. So again, uh, when we looked at, when we compared people who were sports fans and theme park fans, and so that was people who were reported being a fan of only a sports team and only a theme park team, or only a theme park, not both. These are where the significant differences lie. And this is, some of this is to be expected um, because this is bared out in a lot of our other studies. So identification, people reported being more identified with their favorite sport brand than did people who were theme park fans. Um, attitude toward the favorite brand, attitude toward the rival brand. Sport was people who were fans of a sport team reported higher attitudes than people who were theme park fans. Regarding attitude toward a rival brand, people who were fans of a sport team reported more negativity or more negative attitude toward their rival sport team than the theme park fans, which kind of makes sense. Outward perceived was interesting. Theme park fans <coughs> were more negative than sport fans in this setting, uh, in this situation. So basically that means if um, a fan of Universal reported a more, they reported more negativity regarding Disney's prestige than did, say, a fan of the Boston Red Sox before the New York Yankees. Which when I say it that way, seems really, really strange, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so that's, that's one thing when we expand this, that's one thing I want to look more into to kind of get some more answers on that. And then the group behavior composite, that, that um, item that puts together the RPS and the Dwarf Beam scales, um, sport fans were more negative than theme park fans, which makes a lot of sense um, when we look at previous research. Now, when we compared and tested the common fan group, first we looked at people who said they were a theme park fan. Um, and we compared that group with the group of participants who said they were a fan of both a sport team and a theme park brand. Okay? When we did this, the attitude toward the favorite brand was higher for those participants who said they were a fan of both a theme park and a sport brand. Now, if we go back and you look at the, the comparison of sport and theme park by themselves, sport fans reported higher, or higher attitudes, more positive attitudes toward um, the sport team. So that makes sense that sport, kind of that influence of the sport of sport fandom drags over to theme park fandom and makes people who are fans of theme parks um, possibly report higher attitudes toward their favorite theme park brand. There was also one thing that I want to point out, um, and I typically don't, but because I want to expand this, I think it's interesting to point out, um, outgroup behavior was approaching significance. So if we expand it, I want to see if that actually does become significant. Um, because what's more, what's really interesting is theme park fans reported more negativity regarding the behavior of outgroup members 
than the people who were fans of both a sport team and theme parks. And that also supports previous research. It basically says that if you are if you are part of a common in group, you're more positive towards both your favorite and or I'm sorry towards both out groups in both sets. Um, when we compared people who were fans of sports with people who were fans of both sports and theme parks, there were no significant differences there, which is something that's also come out in previous research. Um, so it seems that that sport fandom has more influence over a non-sport fandom than vice versa. Pretty interesting. Now, when I talked about the group behavior composites, one reason we did that is because we wanted to try to compare and come up with a hierarchy of the nine different settings that we had compared. And so what you'll see right here is theme parks is number nine. So that's the current comparison that we had. So they are near the bottom, just right above comets. And you'll see on the spectrum here in just a little bit how far above comets they are. Uh, so when you look at highly negative, the settings that create a highly negative situation for outdoors is online gaming, which is really, really interesting. Um, people who use a PC or people who use a console, because if you've ever played online gaming or if you've ever done online gaming, there's a lot of negativity going back and forth because people are talking to each other while they're while they're competing and things like that. And then obviously followed by politics. I expected that to be number one. Um, and then sports number three. You can see all the way down as you go, low negativity. Any parts is down there, right above comics. And when you look at the spectrum. Go all the way to the left, and you'll see the, you'll see comics with a mean of 3.53, theme parks with a mean of 3.54. Now, one thing that's interesting I want to point out on here is if you look at the theme parks mean, and then you look at the study we did comparing just Disney fans toward Universal, the mean on on the uh, on the group behavior composite score was 4.01. So still, I mean, it's right on the neutral line. Uh, so it's not negative, but it is interesting that when we take, when we expand beyond just the Disney Universal relationship, uh, we get a lower score. And obviously, that's another thing that I want to test if we can get more participants to do this. Um, the importance for this, as I mentioned early on, if you're looking at brand preferences, uh, Disney was identified most as the favorite and the rival brand. Um, which means they are a highly recognizable brand, right? Uh, we had brands like Dollywood and um, Universal, obviously, in there, Six Flags in there. This was mostly um, a United States sample. So, um, but amongst those brands, um, Disney is highly recognizable, obviously. And then, as I said, looking in the future, trying to look at those common names expand this study, so or expand this sample, so we can try to get more answers regarding theme park fandom. Um, but one other thing that we want to do is actually start to test behavior amongst eight group members in that common age group. So in other words, um, is there some way that being a fan of both theme park mm -hmm. and sport fandom, or sport team, does that actually make you more, do something more positive toward an out group? Um, or is that just something that we are uh, kind of compare, comparing and it's, it's theoretical? So thank you very much. Um, I think there's some Two major brands. 
streaming is definitely not streaming for gaming consoles between Xbox and PlayStation. There is, but yeah, when you have like if, if, if you're talking about politics, well, yeah, there's a winner or loser. And so there, when you're right when there is a winner and a loser, that's where we see more negativity. Um, because like specific to let's look at comedy, or think, let's look at theme, theme parks, there are a lot of different brands. You can have a lot of different preferences. Um, one thing that's interesting to me about comics is like most of those comics are about company, like competition, direct competition. However, there's also that common in group. If you're a fan of comics, um, then you, regardless if you like Marvel or DC, if you're a fan of comics, almost versus everybody who might look at comics and think, you know, this is comics, right? Plus the creators are excited. That's true. Yeah. Um, so you talk a lot about uh, So, well, in, in this, this was this was quantitative. Uh, so we didn't do focus groups in this. We have done focus groups in the past. Most of the people that we interact with, though, whether they're focus groups or interviews or quantitative, most people do come from the United States. Uh, we we have expanded. We started expanding um, to where we are collecting data a little bit more outside of the United States, but it's mostly a domestic audience. 